So again, if Christopher Columbus came to America in 1492. The question we're going to answer first is why not before? So who thinks they can guess why? I'll take a few guesses and I'll answer. Ricardo. They were unaware that the Americas were there. That is partially true. That could possibly be true. Uh, Carlos? So why, did they come or? why didn't they come before 1492? Oh. Yeah. Sabrina? Oh, basically, they all thought the world was flat. They all thought the world was flat. So definitely, for a time, we believed the world was flat. But even like the 1400s, we knew that the world was round. But still, 100 years passed before they said, mm, maybe we'll take a stab at this. I'll take one more guess. Mark? Mm, so they didn't have a reason to explore. So that's also a pretty good possible reason. So uh, let me explain why we didn't go out exploring before 1492. The first reason why we did not explore in 1492, folks, is that previous to 1492, the European population was low. There was a very small European population uh, before 1492. And here's why. Here's a population of Europe growing, 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 and then boom! Massive decline for a period of time. So who can explain to me why the European population declined from this period to this period? Why was there such a huge drop-off in the European population previous to 1492? Tatiana? Was it because of the Black Plague? The Black Plague. So the Black Plague is what caused this drop in the European population. Now here's why that's important though. Just because the population is gone does not mean, oh, uh, there's, there's no people here. We don't have to explore. It's this. Let's assume this block that I've just uh, outlined is, the pop is Europe, okay? So if Europe was heavily populated, People might be more inclined to go out and explore. But if the Black Plague suddenly hits and all of a sudden all those people are dead, do you need to go out and explore new land? Do you have to go out and risk your lives to explore some new territory that might be out there? No. You don't have to go out and explore. I mean, was sailing dangerous back then? Yeah. You might die. And so what it was, was if there's enough land where you are, I'm not going to go out and sail. I'm going to go out and just start populating this area. Because all these people are dead, is there enough land for everyone? And so that's the major reason why we didn't start sailing out first. There was no reason to go around because there was enough land because so many people had just died from the Black Plague. Does that make sense to everyone so far? Okay. The second go out exploring before 1492 is that the period before this time was known as the Dark Ages. And particularly what we're going to be talking about is a Dark Age mentality. Why did we call this time period the Dark Ages? Yeah, Nicholas? People start dying and diseases. Yeah, people were dying left and right from the Black Plague. So it was pretty grim. It was not like a happy time. Like the mo majority of people that you knew would be dead in no time. So people were pretty depressed. People were in fact scared. And so when you thought that everyone around you was dying, what are you gonna do with all of your free time when you're not working or if you're not at home? What do you do with your free time when you realize that everyone around you is dying? You're not going to be repopulating because mm, that's probably not likely. You're going to spend the... If everyone is being killed, who do we believe during the Dark Ages is doing that? God. And God is pissed. And he's killing everyone because we're all sinners. And he's killing you and your family and everyone. And the only thing that will save you is praying. But not even in this life. This life does not matter. Here is nothing because what really matters is when you're close to God in heaven and that's what matters. And so if you're in this world, are you gonna be spending your time tinkering and inventing and exploring the world? No, how dare you? You think you're better than me? 
You think you're going to go out and explore the world? That's vanity, and God will smite you with the pox. Instead, when you have free time, you go to church and you pray and you ask, please, God, don't kill me or my family. But if you do, that's okay because I will be with you in heaven sooner. And so do we need to explore it all? Are we going to go out? No. Our life is so church-focused. Our life is so focused on the church that we don't have time to say, you know what, I could probably make that boat faster. Oh, but I don't have the time. I have to go pray for like nine hours. <laughs> and so what it comes down to is that you don't have this type of flexibility to go out and explore. And so that's the first element of the dark age mentality. This focus on the church takes away all of our free time. And again, would we dare to be vain or proud at this time anyway? If you say, guys, look what I did. I'm sorry, what? How dare you? Are you bragging? Don't brag. That's a sin, and you're probably going to die now. <laughs> so that's probably what's going to happen at this time. Let's say we did have someone, though, that maybe questioned going out and sailing. Why might many people be afraid to go out and sail out into the ocean to explore? What were they afraid of? I mean, look at this map. Sea monsters. Sea monsters. I say that with the most seriousness of tones. Sea monsters. We were afraid back then that if you sailed out into the ocean, you were going to encounter sea monsters and serpents and sirens and giant jellyfish, and they were going to kill you. Because what was the only explanation? You, your family sailed out a week ago, and they never came back. Naturally, what is the traditional answer for where your family, or what happened to your family? Sea monsters. Because clearly, we don't understand meteorological readings, or storms, or typhoons, or hurricanes. Here's, here's kind of how it goes. Uh, your family left like a week ago, right? Like, yeah, where'd they go? You know, I don't know. You know what? You know what I think happened? Monsters ate your family. Yeah, that's why I don't go sailing. It's monsters. <laughs> I mean, that's probably what happened. That's actually what did happen. That's why there's sea monsters all over these old ancient maps. That's not for decoration. That's a warning. And so, are you going to test the waters, assuming there's giant serpents in there? No. And so that, as crazy it is, is another reason why we didn't go exploring. So then what changed? What changed? That's the next question we're going to answer. So what changed? What changed? So here's the next question. What? Well, the first thing that changed, folks, is that a new age emerged in Europe. And the age that emerged was known as the Later. Renaissance. The Renaissance emerges at this time. And what type of person comes out of the Renaissance at this time? Philosophers, artists. I mean, describe kind of the attitude of the people at that time. Are they prouder? Are they more confident? They are, right? I mean, the Renaissance spirit at this time, you could describe it as a Renaissance spirit, was this I can do anything attitude. You know, if there was a sea monster, am I okay with that? I can tackle that sea monster. I can defeat that sea monster. You know, in this time, do we have new technologies? Yeah, we have bigger boats. So if there is a sea monster, that's fine because my boat can handle it. We have new weapons so I can fight those monsters. And we have science so there aren't any monsters. The reality is that the Renaissance spirit, again, gave us that I can do anything attitude. It made us feel confident. We felt brash. We wanted glory and honor for ourselves because I'm a human being and damn it, I'm proud of it. That was philosophy of this time. And so I wasn't going to hunker down and be ashamed of who I was. I was going to show the world what I was capable of. And is that the type of person we need to go out and explore? That confident, brash, reckless, I can do anything kind of renaissance person. And luckily, they had technology to aid them. So they had bigger ships. Uh, and the reality is that there was a demand for ships at this time. Because what else happened during this time was the introduction of silk and spice. You guys are familiar with the Silk Road and the spice trade. And here we are in Europe. And all of that silk and spice was coming from where? China. China. And so here's the problem. 
all the silk and spice that's originating from China is sold to this guy, 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 all the way over to us. And by the time all those items have been sold over and over and over and over again, and it finally gets to you in Europe, what's gonna happen to the price? It's gonna be exponentially high. But you are addicted to that salt, that pepper, that cumin. You love that Beijing duck and all those spice and silks. So you want it, but you want it at a cheaper price. So how do you get those same products, but at a lower price? And you sail directly. So sure. So the silk and spice trade created a demand for sailors. It created a new demand for sailors, a new demand for exploration, because they wanted to get those products directly. Okay? Because would it be cheaper if they bought it without all those middlemen? Definitely. And, I mean, when you're selling across a silk road, maybe you can get a camel's load of you know, silk or spice. But on a ship, can you stock your ship full of silk and spice and whatever else? So even if even if this distance is really long, by the way, here's what that uh, trade looked like. You went here, and then you went here. You sailed even more. You went there, and there, and there. And then you sailed there, and you're there. Good, you made it. So when they finally did begin exploring, they did explore and hugged the coast. But will that take a long time? By the way, why did we sail and hug the coast the entire time? Because they don't want to stop seeing the land. Why didn't they want to stop seeing the land? They would feel that they get lost. I mean, I'll give you an experiment, folks. Try this one day. Get into a boat at the beach and go out like 10 miles and then spin around like five times. Then find your way home. How likely will you survive? Unlikely, because is there a frame of reference in the ocean? Will you be like, if you're smart, you can use the sun, but then by the time it's nighttime, you're like, oh, right, that's only out there for so long. <laughs> and so if you're in the middle of the ocean, is there a frame of reference for you? No, you're like, oh, I'm by the tree. Right, there's no trees here. <laughs> so you're stuck in the middle and you get lost. And so for these sailors, they would hug the coast because they would say, okay, let's explore as far out as we can so long as we can see land. So sail up. You see land? We're still good? We're good? Right, stop! Stop! Oh, you're good. Okay, we're good. Okay, okay, now just go again. Sail easily across, and you would hug that land. Because you were afraid that the further out you got, the more likely you were going to die. So they did that for some time, but again, is this efficient? Not really. It takes time, but it's still better than the Silk Road. But many people said, well, why not just sail out this way and end up here? Because the belief was there was no North or South America yet, right? And people said, ha, I'm not gonna do that. We might get lost. And using the logic at the time, was that a reasonable assumption? Yeah. You sail out and you get turned around and you don't know where you are anymore. One storm and you're done, right? So they realized mm, it's too dangerous right now until new technologies were developed. Technologies like the astrolabe. The astrolabe was awesome. Because the astrolabe allowed you to navigate using what? It's called an astrolabe. The stars. The stars. So this, folks, is an astrolabe. And the way it would work is you would take the dials in the center and you would match it with the constellations you see in the sky. Then you would match this dial based on the horizon and you'd be like, oh, that's north. And one way to really know is that I mean, aren't some constellations always in the same direction? For example, where's the North Star always? North. Actually, the South. No, the North. And so obviously, uh, there are certain constellations that will always be there. You know, Aries will always be in this part of the universe. And you know, uh, Capri Cap Cap whatever the other constellation. I don't know constellations. Uh, Orion will be on this side of the constellation. And so they would use these to help navigate at night. And so would this allow them to go into the middle of the ocean now? It gave them some idea of where they were. So they would turn this dial and they would turn that and that help them find the horizon. By the way, there's another cool thing on the back of this that would help you tell the time of day. And the idea is you would use uh, the top piece of this uh, guide 
And when that guy shined a shadow on bottom piece, he knew what time it was. So he'd be like, oh, it's lunchtime. Yeah. And then that's all you know. <laughs> that's about it. So this is an astrolabe, and I'll pass that around. That's an astrolabe. Now, astrolabe is great because now you can sail out and you won't get lost in the middle of the ocean. But problem, when does the astrolabe not work? During the day. During the day and during a storm. So if you had a choice, would you prefer to sell during the day or during the night? Night. I mean, if you had a choice. The day, because, I mean, it's easier. You can see the rocks, whatever else. But that wasn't a luxury afforded to them until another technology was invented called the compass. compass. So the compass was eventually developed. And a compass is good because it always tells you what direction is what? North. So here is a compass. And the basic compass would always tell you, hmm, north. And you always know that's north right there. And would you get lost anymore? Through storm or day or night, could a compass always guide you where you needed to go? And so you would set this and you would say, okay, let's turn our ship this way. And now we know we're going west. So we'll pass the compass around. And so with these types of tools and the types of explorers that were coming out of the Renaissance and the types of kingdoms that were willing to finance these types of explorations, does it now make sense why Columbus was willing to sail in 1492? Yeah. But did all those things have to come together before something like that was possible? Sure, because even if you had the money, it was like, oh yeah, just throw money in the ocean, because the same thing, because you're gonna get lost all the time. And so with all these inventions, Columbus finally sailed in 1492. Everyone good? Yeah. Okay. And he did, he sailed that way. And then the idea was he was gonna land here, right? That was the whole point. But what didn't he anticipate? The Americas. And that was pretty shocking. And so when Columbus finally lands in America, he's like, what? <laughs> Not too pleased. Uh, so when Columbia lands, um, Columbus lands in America in 1492, he does believe he's in India at first, right? He believes there, or there, he's in India. He says, we finally made it. And then he realizes, wait, so you're not the Indians that they describe to us in the stories. They were more clothed. What do you mean you don't have gold or spice? What do you mean you've never seen someone like me before? And what do you mean anything that you're saying? Because I don't speak Native American. And so ultimately what it comes down to is Columbus realizes, wait a minute, this isn't Asia. And yet, is he still okay with this? Because he realizes, okay, I may not be in Asia, but do I realize opportunity? And yes. So Christopher Columbus successfully lands in 1492, and he meets these Native Americans, and the first thing he immediately says is, these Native Americans are savages and barbarians. So the first thing that Columbus does once he lands is he recognizes that these Native Americans are savages and barbarians. He recognizes that these Native Americans are savages and barbarians. And he says that because these Native Americans that he encounters are doing a few things like cannibalism. Who can tell me what cannibalism is? Fabian, eating of other human beings. Oftentimes what they would do is when these Native Americans were fighting each other, at least some of them do this, when they fought their enemy and killed them, they would rip out their heart and eat it in order to gain their strength. Fun fact, that actually works. No, it doesn't. <laughs> mm. I'm gonna try that one day. Uh, so cannibalism. Second thing that made that convinced them that they were uh, barbaric and savages, the Native Americans, many of them performed infanticide. Who can tell me what infanticide is? Murder of children. Hmm? Murdering of babies. So why might some Native American groups murder children or kill babies? 
Maybe some for sacrifices, but not as common. Nicholas? Some might, some might be possessed. Uh, I think there was a belief that, not necessarily possessed, but there was a belief that if the babies were weak, there was no point in them living. Like, they wouldn't be useful to society, so they might kill them off. And in most cases, which gender was often killed? Female. Females. So female babies were often killed over male babies simply because of the need for male babies as warriors. And when they grew up, not like male baby warriors, but like when they grew up to be male warriors, they would be successful. Uh, so infanticide was also something that was performed by many Native American groups. What else did they do that they considered savage and barbaric? Uh, many of them were naked, so they considered that the nakedness was somewhat of a problem, so they were naked, yeah. They also performed Rituals. like human sacrifice. So they said that's not okay. Uh, yes and no. Sometimes you would sacrifice your prisoners of war. Sometimes you would sacrifice like the eldest daughter of the priest and she saw it as an honor to be thrown into a volcano. <laughs> it just depended. Uh, you would also have polygamy. What does polygamy mean? Many gods. Not many gods. That's polytheism. Um, what is polygamy? Multiple wives. Oh. So polygamy. Oh, yeah. So they had multiple wives. They said, that's not right. It's Adam and Eve, not Adam and Eve and, you know, yes. Jessica. <laughs> is there Jessica in this room? Not a name that's in this room. And Eva. <laughs> anyway, so polygamy. They also believed that it was stupid. They said these Native Americans are savage and barbaric because they can't speak Spanish. What are they, stupid? Everyone I know speaks Spanish. Why can't they speak Spanish? They must be dumb. When in reality, does that make them dumb? No. Go to Japan one day when you don't speak Japanese oh. and see what it's like. <laughs> Not easy, guys. Trust me. Um, so they can't speak Spanish, but the thing that really bugged Columbus more than anything about these Native Americans is that they shared. I'm like, wait, what do you mean you all just share the same house and sleep wherever you want? What do you, what do you mean you guys, that's, that's everyone's shovel? Everyone just shares the shovel? Oh yeah, we, we're all friends here. I don't see the boys. That's weird, man, because in Europe, they believe property rights. This is my castle and this is my fence. I even put water around it so you can't come in. Where Native Americans are like, oh no, come in. You can sleep over there on the couch. Ah, I'll sleep on the floor, it's cool. <laughs> like they were like totally friends. And so Columbus was not too pleased with this type. He said, these people are backwards. They are not like us. And because they're different, they must be savage, barbaric, but the word we like to use more importantly is uncivilized. He concluded that based on what he saw, these people had to be uncivilized. And thusly, we would act upon that. Sir? Um, when they shared, do you think of the, like, the property of the Spaniards as their own too? What do you mean? Like wives? No, like their stuff. Like the, oh no. It, like the Europeans were very much like, this is our stuff. But like Nair's like, oh, you can have anything that you want. So they thought that was weird. Uh, but the reality is folks, are Native Americans civilized? Yeah. yeah, they are. So let's answer that question. Were Native Americans civilized? Yes, they were. Well, let's write down the question and then we'll answer it. Were Native Americans civilized. And the answer is yes. I'll give you a few examples. Number one, the Aztecs. Boom. The Aztecs were pretty impressive for a number of reasons. One, those massive like, pillars and temples that they made. But one of their most awesome advances is the floating gardens. 
Now, how many of you believe that in order to grow a garden, you need soil? Like, that's like a necessary component to grow, like, gardens and crops and whatever else, right? That would make sense unless, you know, you were an Aztec, where they said, soil? Ha! Who needs soil when all you need is water that's highly nutritious? The problem with the Aztecs was that they had a lot of lakes and stuff, but not a lot of land. So they said, hmm, what should we do with the land problem? I know, grow crops in the water. And you're like, how is that possible? I don't know, but they figured out 2,000 years ago. That's pretty impressive. Also, fun fact, this is called hydroponics. And hydroponics is what we're going to use to colonize Mars. Because you know how much it costs to send a pound into space? $12,000. So why send soil when all you need is nutritious water? So floating gardens, advanced enough to work in Mars. And that's the Aztecs. Next up, Incans. They did some cool stuff too. For example, what you see here, the step terraces. The step terraces. What they did was uh, they carved steps into the mountain, not for like giants to walk on rather. But uh, when it rains, folks, what happens to all that rain on a mountain that's just like a slope? Landslide. The water saying like slopes down, maybe there's a landslide of some sort. But in a step terrace, they can actually catch that water, put a gate, they'll use that water to irrigate their crops, open the gate next level, open the gate next level, open the gate next level. And then they use the water that for years everyone was letting slide down the mountain. That's pretty impressive. And Europeans are like, I don't know how to grow on mountains. But the natives did. They did a pretty good job with it. And they carved steps into a mountain. That's pretty impressive in advance for a civilization. If that's not impressive, the Incans also performed brain surgery. Not like they actually dug into your brain and performed lobotomies or anything like that. But what would happen is that if you get hit in the head and your brain begins to swell, that's not good. So what they would do is they would take um, like a pickaxe and like a really sharp rock and they would cut out a piece of your skull so that your swelling brain could swell outside before it would recess right back into your head. And the skin would just grow over it again in the future, but you'd have no more bone left. That's like the soft part of your head, like really soft. Um, and so what would happen is that uh, they would do that. So if you, if you had like a really bad concussion, they would cut your skull open, let your brain breathe a little bit, which is, by the way, it's not something you should do. Uh, and then uh, they would be fine. The death rate of this, by the way, was like 7%, which is pretty good considering the other 93% survived after getting a piece of their skull chipped out to let their brain breathe a little bit. That's impressive. Now you might think to yourself, well, Mr. King, wouldn't they die of an infection because their brain was exposed? You'd think so, but the Enkins also developed something called antiseptics. What are antiseptics? Yeah, they prevent infections, right? So they're like, oh, we'll just put this combination of like roots and plants on your skull and you'll be fine. That's pretty advanced. Oh no, it hurt like all hell. Remember guys, no power tools. This is like, hmm, how should we cut that skull open? With a rock and a rock, and how about a rock? <laughs> and then that's how, I mean, that's an actual image of someone, but it's still a clean cut. That's impressive. Uh, so that happened. Now to put things into context, folks, uh, while Incans were cutting holes in people's heads and putting antiseptics to make sure they weren't getting infections, if I was European and let's say I got sick, you know what the solution would be? Quick, let's bleed him. The reason he's sick is because he must have too much blood. So let's put leeches all over his body, suck all the blood out because that must be the problem. And that was a solution. Oh, you're not feeling well? Let's put snakes all over you. The devil's inside of you, so when the devil leaps into the snakes, you'll be fine. Yay, that's a solution. Or you have a cough? Oh, blood, more blood. Oh, we took away too much blood. And you're supposed to die because God said so. So this is what was happening. In Europe, again, the antiseptics in uh, Incan civilizations. In Europe, you got kind of like, oh, I guess you're gonna die. You got infected, oh well. So that's what the Incans are doing, which is pretty impressive. Lastly, the Mayans. 
Ooh, the Mayans. The Mayans had a 2,000 year calendar. How long is the European calendar, or the Roman calendar? 12 months. A year. We have a 12 month circular calendar on the Roman calendar that Europe uses. But the Mayans, a 2,000 year calendar. They understood, looking up at the stars, that because our universe expands over time, that the constellations were slowly moving, and eventually, over 2,000 years, they would reset into another formation. Which is why we were previously in the age of Pisces, the fish, but now we are in the age of Aquarius. This is a new age of our uh, constellation. Nonetheless, based on all of these things, would you say that the Native Americans were somewhat civilized? I mean, these are pretty advanced things. It doesn't mean, I mean, don't discount the fact that they were also barbaric and killed Native Americans and human sacrifices or whatever else, but did they have some pretty impressive things? So here's the crazy part. Christopher Columbus and all the Europeans knew all of this. They knew that they had stepped terraces, they knew they performed surgery. Despite all that evidence though, the Europeans still called them uncivilized. So the question I have is why did the Europeans need for Native Americans to be uncivilized? Or why did they feel the need to call them uncivilized? Why did we have to call them uncivilized? Or why do we have to believe that they were uncivilized. Mark? The, the right. Ultimately, folks, what you should note is that the Europeans needed to believe that Native Americans were uncivilized. They needed to believe that Native Americans were uncivilized to justify their mistreatment, to justify the torture, the murder, the slaughter. Europeans needed to believe that Native Americans were uncivilized to justify the mistreatment. Good so far? And they needed to believe that Native Americans were uncivilized to justify their mistreatment. I mean, we do this all the time. Even today, we do this. World War I, World War II, Vietnam War, Korean War, even in the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. If I told you during World War II, I need to kill those Krauts, those Hans, those barbarians, it's much easier to shoot your gun and point it at someone's head. But if I told you, you need to kill Herman and Fred there, they have two kids and they're very nice. Are you gonna have an easier time performing that task? No. So for us, if we knew like all these Native Americans were nice people, they're well educated, are we going to have an easy time killing them and taking their land? No. But if we say, oh no, we're going to mistreat them, murder, slaughter, but we're doing it because we're trying to help them to bring them civilization, do we now feel okay with our actions? Yeah. We're justifying our murder, slaughter, torture, you know, enslavement of these people because we're saying, oh no, what they had before was terrible. We're offering them something better. And that was the argument that we made. I mean, put it this way, folks. If you knew that ants could have, like, talk and had, like, advanced conversations with each other and be like, what are you going to do today? I'm like, I don't know. I'm really depressed. This girl, you know, dumped me. If you knew those ants were, like, having real conversations, would you second guess maybe, like, stepping on them all the time? Yeah. Maybe some people would. Some of you are just terrible people. But for the most of you, you might actually second guess that they were sentient beings. The same is true for Native Americans. If we knew that they were uh, intelligent, or if we believed that they were intelligent, it'd be much harder to kill them. Nonetheless, what ends up happening is that the black legend emerges because of this. And the black legend was the story of how the Spanish brought death, disease, and slavery wherever they went. The black legend was a story that Native Americans told each other that said, don't trust Spanish. 
all they bring with them is death, disease, and slavery. And this was a story that was perpetuated throughout. Death, disease, and slavery. In fact, of these, or of all the actions of the Spanish, which one resulted in the most deaths of Native Americans? Disease. Disease. In fact, 90% of the Native American population in America died from disease. And of that 90%, the majority died of which specific disease? Smallpox. smallpox. Fun fact, folks, smallpox is the deadliest killer of humans in all of human history. It's killed billions of humans over our lifespan as a species. Uh, and smallpox has been completely eradicated on our planet with the exception of two small vials about the size of baby bottles under 24-hour security surrounded by people with machine guns every day. No, you don't need to know. But the smallpox that we have today is... Uh, why do we still have it? Because in the event, because smallpox is a virus that might naturally occur again, we need to keep it on hand so that we can create vaccines in the future. The other reason that we keep it there is in the off chance that someone else like tries to recreate smallpox and uh, create like a, a virus, like a biological attack on humanity. We have to be able to fix that. Uh, the other thing is that the darker story is that if we ever choose to use it as a biological weapon as well, we still have it. It is the deadliest killer in human history, and we guard it very, very aggressively. Yeah. So, you say that we can use it as a... Biological weapon? So, the United States has it. No yeah. Country. We have it. We have it. Uh, <laughs> interesting story, by the way. There was a guy reading a book in New Mexico. It was an old journal from way, way, way back when. I actually from the colonial era. And he was doing some research. And it was like an old doctor's notebook. So he was reading through it, and there was an envelope inside, and he opened it, and all these flakes came. I was like, oh, what's this? And on the back side, it read, uh, smallpox samples. And he's like, oh, because he realized that this was flakes from someone who previously had smallpox, and the doctor put it inside an envelope for storage, put it in his journal, and then he died at some point, and he forgot that they were there. So some guy about three months ago opened that journal, opened up the envelope, let out the smallpox flakes, and said, oh crap, these are smallpox. Luckily, the smallpox virus was already dead, but that could have been like the outbreak of smallpox again. And fun fact, guys, none of us have an immunity to smallpox anymore. Like if it happened, we'd all be dead. Like, really, guys, I mean, smallpox is the most deadly killer. I mean, 90%. Does it spread through touch? Or? It spreads through cough. And cough is airborne. Ha! You're all dead. <laughs> anyway, so most people died of smallpox and disease at this time, Native Americans. Uh, many tortured. Many Native Americans were tortured, slaughtered. Uh, but many did try to help Native Americans as well, and many tried to do what with them? Convert. Convert or Christianize. So many Native Americans they did attempt to Christianize them, bring them to the church. Um, so there was torture, disease, um, Christianization of Native Americans. But what would happen if Native Americans refused to be Christianized? They killed. they killed them. And the logic was, look, either you let me save you or I'll kill you to save you. Either way, you're going to be saved. Because if I save your soul, then I've done my part. But if you're gonna worship a heathen god, then I might as well kill you now because at least that's less time you'll have to wait in purgatory before you go to heaven. So you have to understand, the reason why I murdered your people, brought disease, enslaved your people, forced you into religion, and murdered so many others is because I'm trying to help you. But that's the logic at the time, isn't it? We're doing this for you. Your religion is stupid. Your culture is dumb. You have no idea what you've been doing, and I know the right way. You know how I know? 
because I have bigger guns and swords and armor. I can show you the way, but you have to do exactly everything I say. And even if you do, I'm still going to treat you like less of a person because we don't look the same anyway. But anyway, Christianization. But for the many unfortunates that survived even a little while, most Native Americans were forced into slavery. So several million Native Americans were forced into slavery, and most of them were forced into slavery through something called the encomienda system. Some of you might be familiar with this from AP World, but the encomienda system was a system in which the king, that's me, would give colonists land. But in addition to giving you this piece of land, I would also give you the people on the land. So that's what I would do as king. As king, I would say, hey, thank you for risking your life and coming to America. Thank you for willing to work here for several decades. Here's what I'm going to offer you in return. I will give you this piece of land in the new world. And if there's anyone living there, you own them too. That was the Gomienda system. They gave them land and everyone living on that land. The crazy part is, did the king have any authority over any of this land or any of these people? No, but they did have guns. And they did have weapons and armor and whatever else. So what the king said was, you get that piece of land. The Spanish guy was like, okay, I own you now. Native American was like, what are you talking about? Well, you see the guy with the gun. Come here. Bang! That's what happens when you don't do what I say. Does everyone now understand? And that's how kind of it went. And so the Encomian system forced these Native Americans into slavery without their choice whatsoever. Now, there was supposed to be an upside to this, and you can tell me if this is an upside or not. The king said, okay, you can own all these people. These are yours now. But you can't just abuse them. If you want to own these slaves, you must also do something good for them. You must Christianize them. So that was all I asked of you. You enslave them, they become yours, but all I ask is you save their souls. That's all I ask. And the owner's like, okay, I can do that. So the owner gets free land, free slaves. The natives get religion, I guess. And the king gets all the gold from all that crops that they begin to plant. Not crops that result in gold, but like they'll sell the crops and they'll get gold and give it to the king. In any case, everyone understand the encomienda system. The problem with the encomienda system and the natives is that what ends up happening to all the natives? They start dying. And so with all these plantations, all my workers are dying. Well, I really like this plantation system. Well, I guess we're going to have to replace the slaves. And who are we going to replace them with? Africans. So eventually, because so many slaves, Native Americans, are dying off, we're forced to replace them with African slaves. African slaves eventually replace the Native American slaves. And why might these Africans be better off than the Native Americans? Yeah, Carlos. They have been exposed to most of the diseases. Precisely. They have immunity already. I mean, have Europeans and Africans been trading for thousands of years by this time? Yeah, and where do you think all that salt and gold came from? The Mali and Ghana Empire in uh, West Africa. So they've been trading for a while. The, the, the West Africans already had their bout with smallpox. So the Africans replaced the Native Americans and they'll survive because they, uh, they have immunity. When those Africans are finally brought to America, this is the last thing you guys should know, uh, they were brought along what is known as the Middle Passage. They were brought along the Middle Passage. The Middle Passage is just the route between Africa and the Americas where they brought the slaves. And they would be put on these slave ships featured here in the top corner. It's a slave ship. And they would take hundreds of slaves and lay them down on the slave floor. 
and they chained their arms and legs to the bottom of the uh, on the deck. And what happened is their legs would not be movable, but their arms could move as much as like their face and their waist. And they would sit there for three to four months. Later, for three to four months, if they were fed, they would feed them with like gruel or like breadcrumbs. They sprinkle it on their bodies and they took pick it up and shove it in their faces. But remember, they're chained there for the uh, remainder of the trip. And so where they lay is where they uh, defecated, where they urinated, where they vomited. And you're side by side four, three hundred other people. And as the boat sloshes back and forth, so do you in the excrement and urine and feces and vomit of your peers. The cuffs would eventually cut into your skin over time as well as your legs. And you can imagine then that at the very end of the trip, the average survival rate on these slave ships was what? Anyone take a guess? What percentage of people? 15. 30%. So imagine a thousand people on a slave ship, 700 would be dead by the time you reached America. That's why they packed them so tightly, because they knew many of them were going to die on the way, so we might as well just uh, take a lot so we can tell them. And we'll end the new lecture on that sad note.